Good evening, everyone. Hello. Good evening. Hello. Good evening. Hello. Good evening. Hello. Good evening. Hello. Can you? <laughs> You're all right. <laughs> Good evening, uh, my name is Linda Key Jackson and I'm the CEO of the Fragrance Foundation and we are truly honoured to be putting this event on this evening and a huge thank you to Sunday Times Style Magazine who um, are here this evening um, for promoting this event um, so that you get the opportunity to come to what is going to be just the most amazing evening. Um, fragrance Through the Decades is something that we have wanted to talk about for a long time. We all have sent memories I think and we go back to times where you smell something and it, it really brings back a memory of a time or a place or a person. So to have Roger Dove here with us this evening, who is one of the world's most respected perfumers, the creator of Roger Parfum, the most successful launch ever in Harrods with Roger's fragrances, he's globally renowned for working with only the finest ingredients in the world. The New York Times says he is a master, a tailor of scent, the Financial Times consider him a legendary figure in the world of scent and fragrance. And GQ have declared Roger is the greatest nose in the world. So, Rolls Royce, Champagne Laurent Perrier, the Victorian Albert Museum, and McCallum are just some of the world's most prestigious brands that have called upon Roger's expertise and imitable style. Such collaborations confirm Roger's place at the forefront of artistic innovation globally. The international success of Roger Parfums combined with the creativity of his um, eponymous creator led Roger's appointment as an ambassador for the Great Britain campaign, celebrating the best in British craftsmanship and innovation. I am so delighted to welcome Roger Dove to the stage. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I was wondering who she was talking about. <laughs> so after all that, my little line before we even start is a simple one. Please don't take me seriously, because I don't. But let's see where we go with all of this. So um, the Fragrance Foundation, I don't know what you know about it, but uh, it was started just after the Second World War. And its job, it's an, uh, a non-profit making educational trust. And so I think that it has an incredible role to play for people that want to learn about perfume, to understand perfume on every single level. So I'm very, very uh, pleased to be able to do this. And because I'm really rubbish at remembering some things, I would like to say an enormous thank you to Guillaume Marley from the uh, Café Royal, who's a nice friend, who has donated the room to us this evening to help support the um, us. So that's a nice thing. Anyhow, so uh, I hope you're going to like the presentation. Um, I want to try to tell you some anecdote to help you understand some of the stories behind some of the perfumes you might not know, to remind you maybe of scents that you had forgotten, but a breath of them will bring somebody you knew back by your side. And uh, hoping this all works out, uh, we prepared a lot of uh, scents for you to smell. Many of them are extraordinarily rare and come from my, I have an archive of old perfumes. Um, I use them for a lot of different reasons, but uh, some of them, maybe it's one of the few times in your lifetime you might get the chance to smell them. There are a couple of them in particular which are extraordinarily rare. So I hope that you like what you smell. <coughs> Anyhow, so let's talk about uh, this amazing industry that is uh, the, the industry of perfumery. So in the very, very beginning, we have always uh, loved perfume. And right from the, really from the beginning, you can say that scent has always reflected the moment in which it was made. And so if you look at this uh, image, which is an old uh, Barbier image for Richard Hudnut, if that name means anything to you, who is a very important old uh, American uh, perfume brand, uh, scent itself, perfume, comes from the Latin through smoke, and so 
from uh, the word perfumum, and I think they're shown very nicely in this particular image. So we see right at the very beginning when Tutankhamun's tomb was opened up, uh, and we start to see things from ancient Egypt, a world we couldn't imagine. Here you see uh, perfumes from Ramses and so on. Uh, one of those bottles is um, from Saint Louis, and the other is from uh, Bacaha. And so everything about ancient Egypt, because it was the fashion. I don't know if there's something happening, and I don't know what the something is. But anyhow, uh, <laughs> this starts to make me feel nervous. Anyhow, <laughs> oh, the screens aren't working. OK, thank you. So um, we have the birth of modern perfumery. So modern perfumery is, without question, a byproduct of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, before 1882, we have very romantic ideas of how we think perfume was. And I remember um, Marie Antoinette's perfume was remade uh, to raise some money for a renovation, uh, a, a renovation of um, one of her palaces, the Trianon. It's gone from my mind where it was. And uh, they sent a bottle of this over to me, so if any journalist in Britain wanted to smell it, they could. And every journalist that came, oh, Marie Antoinette's perfume. And when they smelt it, without any exception, everybody went, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and our expectation today, what we expect from a perfume, is very different to how perfumes were then, because the palette was so very, very tiny. So um, the very first modern perfume was made by Aubigon. This perfume was called Fougère Royale, and it was a scent that was made for men. The year is 1882, and when it was made, it was the first perfume to use synthetic raw materials. Now, people talk a lot of nonsense about synthetics. Generally, there's an old saying, a little bit of knowledge is dangerous. So if you think synthetics are new, they're not. They were first used in 1882, along with a new method of extraction uh, called solvent extraction. And these two things combined allowed modern perfumery. The very first synthetics come from totally natural sources. So you have vanillin from vanilla, you have eugenol from cloves, um, and you have coumarin coming from tonka bean. And it was the vanillin and the coumarin that allowed this scent of Fougère Royale to come. Uh, this perfume is an incredibly important perfume because it gave its name to a, a family of scent. Uh, Fougère, as you know, is French for a fern. These, of course, have nothing to do with ferns. But ferns make us think of freshness when we see them. Think of when the ferns come in the spring, how bright the leaves look against the dark woodland floor. And so the perfumer chose this name uh, to suggest something that was incredibly fresh. Hot on its heels, in 1889, Paris put on an exhibition the likes of which the world had never seen before. Uh, certainly in London, Paris, and New York, there were these international fairs to show prowess and the 1889 fair was the fair that Gustav Eiffel built his Eiffel Tower, which was meant to stand just for one year. And the reason the Eiffel Tower caught people's imagination, it was the tallest man-made structure on Earth since the pyramids. And so we marveled at it. I'm sure that Mr. Eiffel would be shocked <laughs> to think that this one structure today is the symbol of a nation. And I'm sure that a man called Aimé Guerlain would be shocked to know that a perfume he made called Jiki is often referred to as one of the first reference perfumes, uh, if not the first modern scent. Uh, I thought it was interesting to see how this was shown in the original catalog. So here you can see a plate from uh, the original catalog. The bottle is called Flacon Carré. And at this time, what's really important to understand is nobody bought perfume for its packaging at all. There wasn't a middle class. It was establishing itself. So perfume, you had to be rich to buy perfume. And because you most likely didn't have very much else to do other than talk to your 
cook about what you might be having for lunch or whatever else filled the day, um, one of the things you would do is have your perfume decanted into a beautiful dressing table set. So the bottles were very plain. Advertising didn't exist because very few magazines or journals existed. And so the bottles were either cylinders or squares like this, always with very, very big labels on, hoping that if you walked past the perfumery shop, the label was big enough to you, for you to realize what was there was new. Now, this was a great uh, pain to do. I thought that it would be interesting for you to say that you've seen some rather rare things. So these come from my personal collection. And this is one of the original bottles of Chiqui. It dates from about 1889 to maybe 1892. So that caused, that caused a sensation. <laughs> <laughs> and who would guess it? Um, if you think that's the thing, you should see that Jack, the lovely Jack who works with me over there, who's my PR director, was carrying these things across uh, London today. And they said, it's fine. If anything breaks, you're dead. <laughs> <laughs> so next we have a new century. So Queen Victoria is going to die. We have uh, and all the stiff... I think what's important to understand, Queen Victoria went on a trip to Paris wearing an eau de cologne with a hint of musk. And it caused a scandal. <laughs> the journals dictated what women could wear and could not wear. Same for men, but it was more draconian for women. Of course, you all know, women were the property of their husbands. Women wore fabulous necklaces, not for their pleasure, I'm sure, but so that their husbands could show their wealth. <laughs> Maybe you've never thought of it that way, but it's what it was. So suddenly, as the new century comes, you start to get the very beginning of a loosening of this stranglehold on social etiquette. And I chose this Mucha uh, picture of Le Dame au Camille, of Sarah Bernhardt, because I think, in a way, it captures this new uh, feel. You know, she's not got a corset, and her bosom's up under her chin. <laughs> Women fainted all... Do you know how big a uh, uh, waist should be in Victorian Britain? A handspan. Just, you know... Handspan, bigger than that, fat. <laughs> Women used to have their bottom rib removed when there was no anesthesia so they could be winched into corsets. It's why women fainted all the time. Of course they did. And suddenly you have this happening on the uh, stage. So one of the big changes that's going to happen at the beginning of the new century, and it really is a very important one, is this idea of uh, Sigmund Freud who starts to explore our subconscious. <laughs> now, perfumes up until this period have really na boring names. You know, they're called uh, jasmin et lila, <laughs> rose et frangipani. Uh, they're boring. Suddenly, we start to understand the subconscious. And, like lightning, our industry understands that we can explore that. And so we get perfumes with fabulous names. The first was the one with the rather understated flower arrangement on the top. <laughs> it's called Voilà pourquoi j'aime Rosine. This is why I loved Rosine. <laughs> so suddenly, it must make you ask a question. Well, how did Rosine smell? What was it about Rosine? So we start to imagine. Perfume suddenly starts us make, make us dream. And by the side of it, the other thing that's happened, so it's not a new thread, it's why I chose this uh, bottle, we have a perfume, one of the first from Jacques Guerlain, and it's called Le Bon Vieux Temps, the good old days. <laughs> For every generation, people have always said it was better in the past. So this is him, I think, mocking, actually mocking the past, because he started to come with something very modern. So this perfume, Voila Pourquoi J'aime Rosine, this is the first time I've ever bought this bottle out to show anybody, because it's so incredibly fragile, as you might imagine. Uh, but I thought you might like to say that you have seen this, uh, this bottle. So 
You'll be amazed what's lurking behind here. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, uh, and then, uh, so we have um, uh, the Fougère Royale, which is made uh, men's perfume. And in the same period, uh, 1904, Gerlin come, at the beginning, there's a lot about Gerlin. I'm sorry, it's just how it went. Uh, in 1904, Gerlin launched a perfume made for men called Le Mouchoir de Monsieur. And what does this mean? A gentleman's handkerchief. Because society still said that the only people that put perfume on their skin were prostitutes. Courtesans. So, the idea of this was that a man put perfume on his handkerchief. Maybe when he went dancing with a woman, she fell under the spell of the scent. I particularly love the bottles for this because they are wow. in the shape of a snail. The G, so you know, we think of snails in the French diet, and here they have it in this um, uh, bottle. And there was also, for the first time, really a luxury presentation because here you see the snails where everything is filled with uh, pure gold leaf. I, uh, yeah, no, I bought it. So here you see uh, Gerlin written on the shoulder. And as the G comes down, it makes the spiral of the um, G. At the in the same year, Gerlin launched a perfume for women called Le Voilette de Madame. A woman's veil. Then comes this. L'Origon. This is a very important story. Uh, François Coty was from Corsica. He left Corsica and went to Paris. And in Paris, he used to hang around a friend's uh, chemist. His friend was a chemist. And he asked his friend if he could help him. And he said, of course, don't give them yet, please. He asked if he would, um, if he could help. And his friend, the chemist, said, no. And in the end, he said to him, well, why don't you weigh some of the formulas for the eau de Cologne? In the olden days, Cologne is so interlinked with the work of the alchemist and therefore the apothecary, it's why you see in a lot of chemists, perfume is still sold. So... People are having a really smashing time around there. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so we have, um, <laughs> we suddenly have this man who starts to weigh out the eau de colognes for his friend in his chemist shop. And very quickly, Francois Coty felt that these perfumes were boring. So he asked, could he buy some different ingredients in? And his friend said yes. He then decided he would go down to the south of France and learn the craft of perfumery. And he came back into Paris, where he launched this scent. And this scent, L'Origon, was the world's first blockbuster. Um, it's a really important perfume. And in a second, we're going to pass it to you to smell. Now, the world's first blockbuster. So he said this. And I think it's really important to know this thing he said. But to be able to tell you what it is, I need my glasses. <laughs> he said, give a woman, give a woman the best product that you can make, <coughs> marketed in a perfect bottle, beautiful in its simplicity, yet impeccable in taste, ask a reasonable price of it, and you will witness the birth of a business the size of which the world has never seen before. He became the richest man in commerce in the world. Today, most people don't understand the importance of Coty. When I trained, when I grew up, Coty was always referred to as the father of modern perfumery. And most families of perfume, other than the floral, he was the person who started them, the floral and the fougère. L'Origon to a perfumer is actually a family of perfume, although no customer refers to it anymore. So I have brought along this, which is the only uh, original bottle sealed I had ever found. It And you'll see how much is missing. 
because it was sealed. It's, that is missing on the blotters for you to smell. So I have never opened it to give people tonight to get the chance to smell it. I don't know if you can see where you're sitting, but I hope you can. The side of the glass looks as though it's not there. I don't know if you can see from where you are. This bottle is made by Bakaha. Although I see a million people say it's Lalique because of how the stopper looks, but it's not, it's Bakaha. And I think of that wonderful line from Shakespeare, a liquid prisoner pent in walls of glass. Because the glass is so fine, it looks like the perfume is just suspended there. So here is the original uh, uh, Lorigon. They're going to give you a little at the end of the row. Please take them as fast as you can, pass them down. The scent is on, please listen, the scent is on the thin end of the blotter. Saying that, people will still sit there sniffing the fat end. <laughs> That's paper. The scent's on the thin end. And we have labeled them all so that if you want to keep them, you'll remember what they are when you get them home. So can I just, can I just take one? Do you mind? I give it straight. Can I, ooh, ooh. can I just say something to you? <laughs> when you smell a blotter, hold it. When you smell a blotter, hold it this way. If you hold it that way, you won't smell the scent well, and you'll risk jabbing your nose. Somebody at the moment I've just seen is smelling the fat end of the blotter. <laughs> that is paper. So, so, if you want to have an idea of how big this bit man's business ended up, I don't know how many of you know the shop in New York called Henry Bendel. If you know, know it, it's a department store today. It used to be the Coty Perfume Shop. And it has the second largest installation in the world of Lalique, still in the original uh, situ because from the first floor up, the whole of the frontage of the shop is uh, made from, from Lalique. So here on this slide, this is the original uh, advertising for it. And there you'll see the little bottle that I, uh, I had. So you see what it looked like when it was full before you got your noses on it. And uh, so there we are, the world's first blockbuster. We can say that perfumes like uh, opium from Yves Saint Laurent could not exist without this perfume. Just so you understand the importance of the L'Oregon Accord. So next, here's a story for you. Uh, I always hoped that I might end up finding the person that I would end up training. Uh, training. Um, that person I never met. And so I had a little decision to make a few years ago, which was, I've been around a long time, and a lot of what I have in my mind, uh, you know, I have a lot of knowledge in my mind, and I have the great fortune over the years of working with a lot of people who are not alive anymore. So a lot of what I know is very anecdotal. And so I decided that I would write a book on perfumery. I wanted to write it as part of a legacy. And there was a fantastic story and this story is one that wasn't documented anywhere. And it was the story of two people who had a chance encounter. These two people uh, were on the Place Vendôme in Paris, so it's the smartest address of the lot. And one day, one of the men said to the other man, I would like you to design a label to go on my bottle. And this man went off and did just that. But it gave him an idea to expand that idea. And rather than just design the label, he then went on to design a bottle and a box. Now, we think nothing of that today. But it was the first time in history it had ever been done. The birth of conceptual perfume packaging. The two men in question, one I've already spoken about, Francois Coty, and the other was his next door neighbor, a jeweler, a man called René Lalique. And so 
Lalique made the thing you see here is the very, very first label <coughs> made for um, Coty in Lalique, in Lalique, and it was glass. So at the very end of the 19th century, Lalique had been doing some experimental work with glass, but this was the first time specifically he had been commissioned to do something. These early pieces, by the way, are not crystal, they are glass. And he went on to develop a very specific type of glass, which is called demi-crystal. It's not as high a lead content as full crystal, so it's not as brittle looking, and it allows this amazing treatment. This was to hold a perfume from Coty called a flirt, which means to flirt with somebody. So I think, again, if you think of the period, the names would have been really saucy. And it's only gone on a little bit in history, but it's a far cry away from the Victorian straight, straight jacket of the corset, the bustle, and the bustier. So this was one of the things that I wanted to put in my book, uh, because it was really documented nowhere that I knew. This was the very first label on the very first bottle for this perfume when all the smart houses used Bacaha because Bacaha was considered the finest crystal in the world. But in a way, it's formal and it's brittle and it reminded people of the Victorian period. And so the bottle that he went on to design was this. And so this is the first conceptual perfume bottle. Now, I had looked for about 30 odd years to find one of these. And so I hope it's nice to say that if you've never seen it before, this is the original bottle for a flirt. Uh, and again, the idea of it, if you see, the woman is rising amongst the smoke, the Latin for perfume, perfumum. And Coty uses this idea over and over and over in his, in his designs. Uh, interestingly, in the end, uh, Coty used Lalique for nearly all of his packaging, but he then had an idea, maybe I can do this. So he bought his own glass company. And it was an old light bulb company. And they started making the bottles from um, Lalique designs, but he started making them. And Lalique took him to court. And in the end, Lalique and Coty ended their relationship. And so you see, he goes back to Bacaha again. So if you're a perfume bottle collector, be very, very, very careful. Because a lot of bottles you might think are Lalique are not, they're Bacara, as I explained earlier. And a lot of the ones which are Lalique designs maybe aren't made by Lalique. So that's my word of caution to you all. Anyhow, so then we come to the 1910s. So this is the decade the Couturier are going to come uh, into perfume making. So these perfumes and these Couturier are fascinating. So enter the dressmakers, and the first of them is going to be Paul Poiret. Uh, Paul Poiret was really, in his period, the most Im important and influential couturier there was. And he started um, to make perfume, but he said something very famous. He said that no woman will ever wear a perfume bearing a dressmaker's name. He said because women take more care choosing their perfume than they do their dress. Now, interesting, those words, lots of you are laughing at it, those words turned out to be wrong for a very long period. But at the beginning, none of the couturier thought they could sell a perfume with a dressmaker's name. They made dresses. Perfumers made perfume. And what's interesting, we're starting to see a cycle, which I'm going to end up on, where, in fact, the, the perfume makers are starting to come back again. So it's just an interesting cycle, which I'll come on with. So here, I love this. Uh, uh, Joanna, I have to say, Joanna, who's my designer, who I worked very closely with, this, just doing the graphics for this took her about one and a half solid weeks' work. Um, so this, I love, cœur en folie, your heart's gone crazy. Uh, and so the advertising for it looks fabulous. Uh, she's been struck by her heart. The bottle is of a little heart. Uh, there was a perfume by Raphael that came later for any real fragrance diehards in here, um, which was a copy of that bottle, but that's the very, very first one. So we have uh, Coeur en Folie, and then comes, that's the quote I just said, and then comes this uh, perfume. Uh, look at the dress. You know, here's the man that got rid of the bustle, the bustier, and the corset. He, he created the liberty bodice. Think of um, 
Jesus, what's the name of the uh, the Fritz Lang film? Uh, Metropolis. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. But look at this. I mean, it's like the woman in, in Metropolis. And I love the name of this uh, perfume, uh, Coeur en Foot, uh, Love Struck. So it's like lightning, she's uh, love struck. So he, but he really did not believe that a woman would buy a dressmaker's perfume. And so he named his perfumery after his daughter, Parfum de Rosine. The company that exists today called Rosine is nothing to do with the original, although the woman who owns it is absolutely gorgeous and makes lovely scents. But this was the original Couturier perfume. But it really was a family affair. And so you see these wonderful, uh, this is a Georges Lepape, I think, uh, illustration on a fan. And what he used to do, he would, on the back of this, had the list of all the perfumes. And when you went into a room like this, which is quite hot, in front of you would have been a beautiful fan, and it would have been scented with a perfume. So when you sat there all evening, <laughs> you were smelling that scent. Um, so that was very clever. But it really was a family affair, maybe to shut his other daughter up, because maybe she was upset something wasn't named after her. He ended up uh, launching a company called Atelier Martin, which was the name of his other daughter. And all of the bottles uh, were done like this, painted by hand, with silks on the top, or uh, printed by hand. Uh, they're really quite wonderful. I love the name of that lavender water, the only one. <laughs> um, anyhow. So... Then we come with uh, Caron, Le Narcisse Noir. Um, I've, had a very, I've had a very lucky and a very charmed life. Uh, I remember Caron has had a very interesting recent history, i.e. in the last 25, 30 years. Um, the man who founded it, Ernest Daltroff, I think was an utter genius. He had no formal training. He broke every rule because he never knew what the rules were. And with Caron, <coughs> you... you with Caron, you either uh, like his work or you don't. It's totally polarizing, but I think they're genius. So you have to look uh, with this perfume at the date. It's 1911. This is you know, really the height of the Belle Epoque era. We have um, this wonderful image for this picture. Look, she's got her clothes half off. Uh, so the world's moving on. But a black Narcissus. I think I was saying just 20 odd years before perfumes were called jasmine et rose, and now there's a black narcissus. What does it mean? The most famous use of this perfume was in a film with Gloria Swanson, who swept the bottle up from her dressing table, and uh, suddenly a flower can end up not smelling pretty like a bunch of flowers anymore. Don't forget, society said women should be like flowers. No sexual drive, no political point of view, and women were named after flowers. Rose, lily, violet, and marigold. Sudden, suddenly, we've got a black narcissus amongst us. What's that all about? So this bottle is arguably, so that's the original bottle of um, Baccarat. It smells very strong because all of that leaked on the way here, <laughs> which is another story. Um, but this Baccarat uh, presentation for <coughs> black Black Narcissus, um, in its time, this was such an important perfume that uh, you'll see hundreds of copies of this bottle. But very, very uh, special and very important scent um, as well. <coughs> OK, so then comes this. I don't know if you realize how important Calcafleur was. Um, I'm very proud, please. You can still buy the perfume of Calcafleur because I ended up meeting the family who owned Oubigon, and I petitioned them and petitioned them and petitioned them to remake the perfume. And in the end, they did. This perfume, made in 1911, laid down the basic structure for all floral bouquets. One could argue that perfumes like Lanvin's Arpège, Chanel No. 5, L'Air du Temps, blah, 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 could not exist without it. It gave us the formula, the basic structure of jasmine and rose and ylang in the base sandalwood and vanilla. And we see this formula over and over. And it's so important. I love the fact it has the name 
quelques fleurs, some flowers. <laughs> um, so this perfume, I think you, one could argue it is this perfume that really laid down, along with others, but uh, France's reputation for leading in perfumery. Uh, France was going to take over perfumery, and I think this is one of the most important perfumes to make that, uh, that happen. I thought it was interesting to look at how the, the genesis of the images, so you have by this time, you can see some in slightly 50s, and I love that on the right-hand side, I selected this image specifically, because if you think 1911, how plain and simple and modern the graphics are, where it says here, the latest creation from Ubigon. Uh, so next, uh, Heure Bleu. For me, when, what do we have? Oh, sorry, and I have, and I open my bottle of quelques fleurs. Uh, <laughs> now, it's really important. Um, there are a lot of raw materials that one cannot get anymore for a lot of different reasons I don't want to go into, but you just can't get them. This is the original formula for quelques fleurs. So I hope you love it. I hope it's interesting because it has an enormous modernity to it, in a way, and yet it's so old. So, <clears throat> sorry, if you don't mind whilst you're sniffing, if I can carry on talking because we will get thrown out at a particular stage of the <laughs> evening. Um, so, L'Heure Bleu. Uh, as maybe many of you know in this room, that's the house I fell in love with when I was young and it's where I trained. And the one scent for me, which is the scent of that house, is this one. I believe that... I believe that Jacques Guerlain was maybe one of the most romantic of all perfumers ever to have lived. You'll see many of his perfume compositions come off formulas that were started or themes that were started by uh, François Cossy, and he refined and polished them and made them his own. L'Heure Bleu, the story of L'Heure Bleu has always been that one night he was walking by the edge of the River Seine at that moment when the sun drops from the sky but the sky hasn't yet found the moon or the stars. And he felt it was something so tender and some, something so beautiful, he wanted to capture that moment in a perfume. And so the perfume he worked on was this scent, Leur Bleu, which is the precursor to what is going to become the oriental uh, bouquet, which hasn't been created yet. This perfume was originally given uh, to his wife, Lily Guerlain. And if you think that she was married to the most important perfumer, or one of the most important perfumers of the period, of all the things that she could smell of, this is what she chose to smell of. And when I smell it, it makes me think 100% of nowhere other than, uh, than the Guerlain boutique. What did I put here? Uh, so he said this lovely line, I felt something so intense I could only express it in a perfume. And I think it's one of the things that we often forget. I've always said a perfumer is like an artist, a poet, or a storyteller. But we don't use paint, and we don't use words. We create something tangible from the intangible. You have to have an idea, and then you have to stop to think of how all the raw materials you put together end up making that abstract idea become a reality. It's not like a painting where you look and think the shading here needs to be a little bit different. It's not like a dressmaker who can see that the, s the sleeve isn't set in properly. We have something totally intangible that we work with. Anyhow, next, a new style for a new woman. Enter Coty again. Now, what you're about to smell, I hope, really is precious to you. Uh, this perfume, if ever a bottle comes up for sale, everybody goes totally nuts for it. Nobody cares particularly about the bottle. Everybody wants it for the juice. 
This is a Cote's Chypre. This is uh, the perfume, which is the reference for all modern Chypre. The Chypre is French, if you don't know, Chypre is French for the island of Cyprus. In Greek mythology, Cyprus was believed to be the birthplace of Aphrodite. And legend says that Aphrodite slept on a bed of mosses. And so this legend was used as... I think we're in the wrong side of the room over here. The party is over there. Um, so the, the, um, the, this legend became the basis for uh, this new style of perfume. But again, what you have to understand is what was going on in society at that time. Women in Britain, women in Sweden, had just won the vote. Not all women, but some. Women were craving independence. They'd rejected the bustle, the bustier, and the corset. I've spoken about it. A new silhouette is going to come. And in a minute, a little later, the flapper is going to be born. Women don't want to be treated as owned by somebody. And they don't want to be a rose and a lily and a violet and a marigold anymore. And so they take this new style of perfume based around what have been considered masculine raw materials, woods and mosses. And so the sh this perfume, Chypre, was born. It is one of the most amazing perfumes. And when I was redoing my book, I went to the Osmotech, which is a perfume library museum uh, for professionals in Versailles, because I wanted to go through all the work of Coty and also um, uh, Rosine and one other perfumer, Germaine Cellier. And I suddenly saw to be able to make this, I saw something that I'd never seen, and to be able to make it, they had to make a tincture of oak moss, which is never normally done as a tincture. It's normally done as um, uh, an essential oil. So here is the original formula for Coty Sheep. I hope you love it. And up here, this is the new trademark of, uh, of Coty, for sheep, and this, the original advertisement, or one of the original, it's not the original, an early bottle. So I hope you like it. And if you put it by the side of the perfumes you smell before, you smell how very floral they are, and in here you get this warmth and this dryness. This is for a very self-assured modern woman. That is who this was made. The sheep are for that. The Chypre is appeal. The Chypre's appeal still today to women who don't have it will do in their vocabulary. <laughs> they know black and white and grey is of no interest to them. Uh, and that's always how the Chypre has been. You love them or you they're not for you. But this a brand new style of perfume. The second family of feminine perfume is born. And uh, there you see, it was also put. It. Yeah. What can we get into that conversation later? <laughs> <laughs> it's talking about formulas is a big, uh, a big story. I think the perfumes in this period had an extraordinary quality to them that you don't smell in so many perfumes today. They also have, uh, some of them, an animalic sex sexuality almost that absolutely you don't smell in most perfumes today. Because we live in a squeaky clean, sanitized world where, where your countertop most likely has more germs on it than your lavatory seat because we're told on the television. So, <laughs> anyhow. So... Here we come, the final act of defiance. So, <laughs> so women have fought for emancipation. The world is changing. There's a middle class. And suddenly, the last act that women are going to do in this period is captured by Ernest Doltroff, the perfumer of Coty. He comes with an idea that he wants to make a perfume for men. But he has met a woman called Felice von Puy, who he lived with for years, totally unmarried, which would have been scandalous, openly, uh, which would have been scandalous. She designed all the, the bottles and the packaging, and she said to him, no, this should be a woman's perfume. And this perfume was called 
tabac blonde. Now, at the time, men generally smoked cigars or they smoked Turkish cigarettes, which have a very, very strong odor, if you know it. So this Virginia tobacco was considered very light, very pale, and too effete almost for a man. So these Virginia cigarettes started to be taken by women, and the final act of defiance, women did not want to be seduced anymore. And when a man tried to do it, they took their cigarette in their cigarette holder and blew smoke straight in his face. And so this is the original um, bottle for Tabac Blonde. Uh, on the front, you see the design of the Nicotiana, the uh, night-scented uh, tobacco flower, which I'm sure you know. If you look up on the screen, because they'll flack up uh, quite quickly, this, an original advert, you see a cigarette by the side. Could you imagine advertising a woman's perfume today like that? But this said modern. She's a modern. She's, she's a modern girl. And here by the side, um, this is a lipstick ad. But this perfume, when it was first launched, this perfume, when it was first launched, was used to actually perfume the cigarette. So people put drops of perfume on the cigarette. And the other perfume that was used that way was by Molinard, the next decade, a perfume called Habanita. And both of them were made originally to scent perfumes, uh, cigarettes. So, So when the Chypre was launched, what's important to understand is the world had never smelled scent like it before. So of course, what perfumers did was look at the new harmony to see what they could do with it. So it went off in the world of tobacco in the scent Tabac Blonde through Caron. And the other perfumer that took hold of it was Jacques Guerlain, who ended up adding a new aldehydic note, aldehyde C14, which is the note of peach. And so we start to get fruit coming in perfumery. The reason that I headed this slide up, a secret love affair, the story of this perfume is quite a lovely one for, are you her type? Um, because there was a very important novel. I think it's interesting looking at how society sees itself. So this advert actually comes from the 1930s. It was done by a French female illustrator called Darcy. And I don't know if many women maybe would relate to it today, but in the 30s, that's how a woman might want to see herself. So I think this idea of how we change our perception of ourselves through advertising and perfumes is actually quite an interesting one. So there was a very, very famous novel written by Claude Ferrer called Le Bataille. And in Le Bataille, we hear the story of a woman called Mitsuko, who is married to an admiral in the Japanese Navy, but she falls in love with a Western naval officer. And she knows that she has to keep this love affair totally and utterly secret. Just something inside her heart. And it's why, when you look at the bottle for Mitsuko, you'll see, if you can imagine that bottle turned upside down, there is the hidden heart. It holds the secret that inspired the perfume uh, below. This perfume was always referred to by the Gerlain family as the pride of Gerlain. Of all the perfumes they made, why were they so proud of this? Because most perfumers believe it to be one of the most perfectly balanced perfume formulas ever written. And then here we see coming another image from the 50s, the idea of a cherub watering a tree and the flower that comes on it are bottles of Mitsuko. <coughs> then the 20s, and we have decadence and darkness. These are the two themes of this uh, decade. So in the 1920s comes something very unusual uh, from Chanel, a gift with purchase. 
the reason I put it is simple. Chanel, who was no shrinking violet, mm -hmm. did not believe that anyone would buy her perfume. So she gave her perfume as a gift to her clients. So what is the story of this perfume? Have I missed something out? No. Um, so the story of this perfume is an interesting one. Uh, it, like a million things, is shrouded in legend, and who knows what the origin is. But uh, the, the important thing of this perfume is that she met a man called Ernest Beau. Ernest Beau was the last perfumer of the imperial Russian court. He made perfume for the Tsar, and he made perfume for the Tsarina. And it is believed that the root of number five comes off of a perfume that was made for the last Tsarina of Russia. In it, he had been working around a set of raw materials called aldehydes. Now, a lot of people say this is the first time aldehydes were used in perfumery, which is wrong. Kelka Fleur was the first person known slightly to use aldehydes. But it was the first to use them in overdose. And there are a hundred legends around this perfume. One is a blame one, which is that his assistant misread the formula and made a mistake. <laughs> and the other story is that she gave him so little time to make the perfume that in one of them he had overdosed the aldehyde, but he hoped from the others that she was given that she would find one she loved. So the man who made the perfume, the legend says, was nervous of his creation. Anyhow, she was given the bottles and she smelt them. And on them, on one of them, aldehyde in overdose. She stopped, never smelt the rest, so legend says. She said, this is my perfume. It was one he was nervous of. And everybody said, what will you call it? And she said it would bear the name it bears now, for it, it will bring it luck. On the bottles were little numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 20, 21, 22, 23, and 24. And that was the fifth one. She was a wildly superstitious woman. Five had always been her lucky number. She was showing, she wanted the perfume for the 5th of May, the 5th of the 5th. That was the day that she was showing her collection. So she believed that destiny brought this perfume to her. And so here... What I want you to smell, I would like you, before you smell this, to just listen to this. When you smell it, I'd like you to try to think of it in a different way to the way you maybe do. I'd like you to think of going over a bump in a road when you're just about to drink a fizzy drink <laughs> and it goes <laughs> in the back of your nose. If you can do that, you will smell what she thought as modern and he was frightened of because that's what the aldehydes do. They make the flowers sparkle like a firework. So here is a number five. <coughs> now, would you mind awfully, and I know that all you're doing is talking about what you're sniffing, but could I ask with this one if you wouldn't mind not talking but silently sniffing, because I hope that what's just about to come up is worth not talking about just for a second. I thought that it might be interesting for you to, you all know this, to see the genesis of this bottle. So you can see that the bottle started off looking like this. So in 1921, here's the first bottle, which by 1930, the lid has changed. You know that if you look down on the lid, the shape of the lid is an aerial view of the Place Vendôme. Then we suddenly see that the stopper thickens slightly in the 50s, and then in the 70s, the, the stopper changes again uh, to a much, much thicker design, and then the bottle is reinterpreted again for the Eau de Parfum. But what I hope, which is why I ask if you wouldn't mind not to talk, which thank you very much not for, because I thought that you might like to say you've seen this. It's the only one that's known. Might be others, but it's the only one that's known. Um, I gave a lecture many, many years ago for the Comité Français de Parfum for um, an exhibition, most important exhibition in perfumery called L'Hymne de Parfum. In Britain, it was called A Heavenly Scent. And the inaugural lecture I did with a gorgeous man called Guy Robert. He was the perfumer that gave us Calèche and Madame Rochasse and Equipage. He was 
most gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous perfume. And he was the vice president. And he was standing on the stage in the museum. And I started to talk. And I felt this man pulling toward me. And I thought, what am I doing wrong? <laughs> so I've got everybody staring at me, as you're doing, which is quite a thing when you're standing up here and everybody's looking. And, um, and I'm just thinking, what am I, what, what's wrong? Anyhow, I carried on going. And at the end of it, he said, I need to see this. He looked in the archive of the Comité Francais de Parfum. They have no record of it. And he contacted the Wurzheimers, who own Chanel, and they have no record of it. So maybe it's the only one. It's the original presentation for Chanel number no. 2, Chanel number no. 5, Chanel number no. 11, and Chanel number no. 22. So I hope that it's nice to say that you have uh, seen it. So just it's a long way over on this side, so I hope you don't see. Anyhow, so what I'd like you to see now, so this is a little pause while I show you various things. You know I explained to you that perfume came in very boring bottles. It really didn't matter who you were. This is the only known example in the world. This is Bouquet Victoria. It was made for Queen Victoria. And please don't forget that the queen at this time, this queen, empress of most of the world, was arguably the most powerful human being ever to have lived. And this is the perfume that was made for her. Why am I asking you to look at it? Because if you take this bottle, can you not see that it's actually just that bottle minus the chamfered corners? So this, in fact, is a very modern, pared-down interpretation of a classic perfume bottle. And then when you come back to the original bottle that you all know when you buy number five, can you not see that it's this bottle squished? So I love reading articles about design when I hear how modern this this that was, so I don't have one of those in my hand. And I think, no, no, the root of it is this, that somebody just altered. Genius, but they altered it. So there's Bouquet de Victoria. She had a consort who was called Prince Albert, the only known example of that. When I'm not here anymore, these two bottles will end up in the Victorian Albert Museum because it's where they should be. And across the pond, Bouquet Napoleon. So this was made for Napoleon. So um, I believe we're going to do oohs and ahs and ums. I, I really don't bring these out very often, and some of these I've never bought out before um, because they really are terribly precious. The reason I'm bringing them, in particular those, I want to try, I'm trying to get across how design and smell is all interlinked um, somehow or other. So, blah. So what made her, one of the things that's made her I think that people forget she wasn't. She was a really important designer, but all the designers of this period were. You know, she, uh, it's another story. But one of the things she did was took men's underwear fabric, jersey. Jersey had only ever been used for men's undergarments, but she saw that this fabric was the perfect fabric for her new silhouette. And this idea of the dress that you saw on the slide before with the cardigan over, um, she used cotton jersey. So this is an illustration of her by a man called Sem, who always wrote rather uh, rude things about her, and she wrote rude things back. So uh, she said this line, which everyone knows, a woman without a perfume is a woman without a, a future. Um, but the other thing, which I think was really important to understand, in this period in history, we really have turned our back on uh, Vic Victoriana. So look, it's 1921. It's 20 years after Queen Victoria has gone. But you have people like Mies van der Rohe and Le Corbusier and Eileen Gray. You have all this uh, real modernism. Suddenly, we have chrome on the outside of furniture. We want to show it off. We have plate glass. So really, modernity is uh, born. And so I thought it was interesting for you to maybe see the original. It didn't come in. The, today, this is a card box which splits. But originally, it's like a Zippo lighter. Inside, lined in uh, chamois. So 
I hope that's nice to say you've seen. Sorry, I forgot I'd also brought this along. Oops. Uh, that's Tabac Blonde uh, with a big <laughs> caron on the top. So, blah, blah, blah. Uh, <laughs> so I need some water. So, could some of you smell this in your nose? So, today we don't smell perfume because we smell brands. I'm wearing Dior. I'm wearing Guerlain. I'm wearing Chanel. When somebody says that to me, I always say, you must be very strong to wear an entire company. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, I think it's nice, hopefully, that we smell this, really what made this what it is. So, today when we work on aldehydes, we, of course, smell... Number five, it's the best example of it. But it's the best example because of the sparkling aldehyde in the top. Next, look how we've moved on. Uh, this woman, on whatever she's on, but terribly happy. <laughs> uh, so the flapper is now born. And along with it comes an influence from America, nightclubs. And it's very hard for us to imagine the impact of a nightclub. So I'd like most of you to think back to Downton Abbey and think, how did most people in society meet other people? It was all arranged by the family. You only met people that were known by the family. Suddenly a nightclub comes along. And you look at strangers. <laughs> and you meet strangers under the safety of darkness. And our industry is going to take that theme and you're going to see it through the 1920s and 1930s. So this first scent, Nuit de Noël, made in 1922, is really a homage to the, the flapper. I put this quote because I love it. Guy Robert said that if a woman walked into a room wearing Nuit de Noël, all the other women would become invisible. Uh, so here is the original uh, imagery for Nuit de Noël, and here the original bottle. And what I hope you can see, so the galusha or stingray, was something, my cleaner has ruined this label, I quickly will tell you. It used to be perfect. She <laughs> polishes hard. Um, but do you get what this is about? This is the flapper's headdress. And the flapper is going to do her flapping in a nightclub. And when she flaps, she's going to meet a stranger if she's lucky. I think she's really desperate to meet somebody here. But <laughs> <laughs> anyhow, so I hope that it's nice to see uh, this. Uh, and what's, inter <coughs> what's interesting, what's interesting uh, these bottles are made from Bacaha crystal. So the concept that you would have very fine crystal made in glass, because crystal is about the refraction of light, and black is about the absorption of light. So in a way, it's uh, strange, but it gives us something really very, very beautiful. God, somebody's leg's fallen off now. <laughs> <laughs> so next. <laughs> so the next. <laughs> so the next, um, the next scent. I explained that I think that Jacques Guerlain was maybe the most romantic perfumer who has ever lived. And I'd like you to really imagine this story. Um, in the late 1910s or very early 1920s, a Mughal ruler of India, a man by the name of Shah Jahan, arrived in Paris. You have to imagine how exotic this man would look in his beautiful silks and pearls and jewels with a turban. And he tells the most lovely story of, sorry, I said Shah Jahan came, that's rubbish. Sorry, a Mughal prince came and he told the story of Shah Jahan, the last Mughal ruler of India. This man fell in love with a woman called Mumtaz Mahal and for her, he built a special garden, and he called his garden the Garden of Shalimar. Shalimar is a Sanskrit word which means temple or home of love. The gardens were like nothing the world had seen before, for they were made out of a series of crystal pools and fountains at a time when crystal was more costly than gold, which is why the 
mirrored ballroom at Versailles is so, uh, was so famous. She had many, many children by him, but never the son and heir he was desperate for. She fell pregnant, and in giving birth to her little boy child, she died. And Indian legend says that he felt so responsible for her death, her name was forbidden to be mentioned in his presence, and that his hair turned white overnight. And it is said that he was so possessed with this love for her, which was like a fever, and so he commissioned the greatest artist and craftsman of India to create a shrine to house her memory and to house the memory of Mumtaz Mahal, the Taj Mahal was built at Agra. So Jacques Guerlain wanted to create his own monument to this love story, and so he created the Saint Shalimar. So this is the original <coughs> advertising for Shalimar, and this is the original bottle, and it was made for about one year before they modified the design. You see in the original bottle, there is a little hole at the bottom of the stopper where the silk, to make this little, bar, it's called a barbichette, uh, to hold the stopper in. But that little hole made a weak point. So when you stoppered it, it would often crack. So they got rid of it. So if you ever see one with a little hole, it's a bottle from 1925. And if you look, you can't see it well in this photograph, but if you look at it uh, on the very first ones, the glass had an incredible violet inclusion on the blue. And they had to stop doing that after about a year because it was so dangerous. They're all Baccarat. But to get this particular shade of blue, they used to use mercury in the firing, which, of course, is very dangerous. But in the time, people didn't realize it. So this bottle... I thought you might like to say you have seen the original one. That's the bottle you'll see in this picture. And what I hope is a nice thing to hear, in my industry, in a perfumery somewhere near you, are these love stories. For this bottle, the blue symbolizes the night sky under which they made love, the neck and the shoulder of Mumtaz Mahal, the drape of one of her cloaks spilling down her back, and it stands on, a uh, on one of the crystal pools from the garden. So I hope that that's a nice thing, because I'm sure you all know the bottle, but maybe you didn't know the story. So, blah, blah. So the next thing I hope is interesting, uh, I put these, oh, this is just lovely. An Indian poet said about the Taj Mahal, it stands like a solitary tear suspended on the cheek of time. How beautiful is it? And the next thing I hope is interesting, there was an English company called Dubarry. And Dubarry made many things, soaps and talcums and bath salts, and they made a hand cream. And they called their hand cream Shalimar. And their factory, the building is still there, is in Hove, just outside of Brighton. And Guerlain was so very upset that this perfume had the name Shalimar, so they didn't want to change the name of their perfume. So for Britain, they made the perfume with these numbers, number 90, number 91, and number 92. I put these in my book because I've seen a very important book written on Guerlain where somebody says something factually incorrect about them. So so that you know, number 90 was and always has been the reference number in the catalogue for 30 mil perfume. Number 91 was always the catalogue number for a 60 ml perfume, and number 92 was always the catalogue number for a and still is for 125 ml perfume. So I just think it's quite nice that if you see these, they were made for Britain because a company made a cheap hand cream <laughs> and Guerlain were having none of it. <laughs> so next, another beautiful story, uh, Lanvin. Lanvin became the most powerful couturier in the world. She employed more people than any other couturier of her period. She came from a dirt poor background, and she worked really, really hard to make her name. She totally adored her daughter, and this very, very famous image, which I'm sure you know, is designed by Paul Hérib. Paul Hérib was a famous illustrator. He's the person who ended up uh, living his life having an affair with Chanel. And um, 
it is because this perfume is based on the gift of a mother to a daughter. So, <coughs> blah, blah. So I put the words here, but I don't ever use them, just in case I forget them. Yes, what I said. So I love this. Promise her anything, but give her Arpej. Uh, <laughs> so um, anyhow, I love this thing that her daughter was a very, very accomplished, accomplished, accomplished pianist. And so she commissioned this perfume to be made, and she gave it to her daughter as a gift. And it was called Arpege, because of the Arpeggio. Here, the bottles. The bottles were designed by Armand Rasso, a very famous uh, Art Deco designer. And what is, uh, whoop, whoop, whoop. what is really nice with this um, story, you have these wonderful uh, illustrations with these marvelous names. So you have perfume, scandal, pretext, arpege, eau de l'envin, rumeur. And then there's the man standing at the back rather unlikely, with a lady poking out of his loincloth. <laughs> now, um, I put here, a sin with no success. What's that all about? So this first perfume, the very first perfume of Longvin, was made by the first woman perfumer of our industry, Madame Z. Her name was maybe Enid Smith, really. I have no idea, but Madame Z is such a fabulous name. So she created this perfume called Mon Péché. It was a flop. But then just look at the man, because they changed the name of it. They translated it to English, My Sin. And suddenly, it was a blockbuster for them. <laughs> and so you'll see how prominent My Sin is in their advertising. The beauty of this uh, story is that her mother, Jean Lanvin, worked and worked and worked and worked, and in the end had enough money to own a very old French coin. And this uh, coin was called a Louis. When she died, her daughter found that she had never spent the Louis. And so her daughter buried her with the gold coin that she'd worked so hard for. So I have to be very aware of time. I think I'm going too slow. I have to start talking very fast. So you're not allowed to talk. We need to hitch our britches up and off we go. So um, next comes Jean Patou. Jean Patou started off with three perfumes, Amour, Amour, Qui sais-je, and Adieu, Sagesse. What does it mean if you don't speak French? Very, very simple. To fall in love, to ask yourself, what do I know? And in the end, goodbye wisdom, because often when we fall in love, that's what happens. And here's how the bottles look. Yes, I'm sure. I, no, I didn't bring one of those. You don't get to see that, sorry. Uh, so, in 1921, uh, he absolutely shocked the world. He invented uh, the sporty clothes. He sent the tennis player, Suzanne Lelong, out onto Wimbledon, wearing a cardigan and a headband and so on. And so the sportive look was born. And interestingly, he launched a perfume called Le Sienne, which was the first unisex perfume. So it was actually sold, first one. Other people say other things. This was the first. And if you look, it's for the sportive woman, but also it's a parfum masculin. <laughs> so it's saying that a little masculine man. The other thing he did, he was the first person to make suntan oil. And so it, this oil was called Richardé. And this was, became such an iconic thing that uh, people loved the scent so much that he ended up turning Chalde into a perfume, which is how you can buy it still today. Um, in 1929, he commissioned his perfumer, to make, Henri Almeras, to make a new scent for him, and uh, he, he liked none of them. And in the end, Almeras said to him, I have one left, but it's so expensive you'll never be able to sell it. Patou said to him, nonsense, double the juice. The name for our formula is the juice, so double the concentration. And he said, this perfume will be as Rolls-Royce are to motor cars. And so the perfume was made. He commissioned the bottle made by Baccarat, and on New Year's Eve, 1929 into 1930, Wall Street has just crashed. His clients have lost their fortunes overnight. Rather than stepping away from this idea, he sent a liveried footman to the front door of his wealthy New York clients with a velvet cushion. And on the velvet cushion was a bottle with a little tag around its neck. And it said one word, joy. 
for he hoped he brought happiness back into their lives. And so, well, I'll show you it in a minute. So, so, uh, so uh, John Hadfield's joy was born. The next day, a New York journalist, a woman called Elsa Maxwell, wrote, it is the most expensive perfume in the world, and so the legend was born. He also had a very clever idea. He realized that most of the men that went along with the women to his couture house got very fed up. There was a moment when the men just got fed up. So he decided he'd open a club inside his couturier. And so the men had this fabulous place, and suddenly they were very happy to go dress shopping because they met their friends there. He then expanded that idea and came up with something very novel, uh, an idea called cocktail. And so he created a small perfume bar. And this is Henri Almeris, the perfumer behind. It's one of the only photographs of my nose who exists. And so they made this little cocktail cabinet that a woman could take home with dry, bittersweet, and so on and the little bottles in front with things like Angostura, and you could make your own perfume when you were at home. Uh, this is the original bottle and original story for Jean Patou's joy, and so I thought it was nice to say that you maybe have seen that was what landed on people's front doors in 1929, going into 1930. The original Baccarat bottle, engraved and dipped with gold, I tried to bring interesting things. And then, uh, what's here? And then, 1935, and we end up wanting to cross the world in luxury. And so many boats came, but the Normandy was like no other. And so for the inaugural sailing of the Normandy, Patou was commissioned to make a perfume for every woman traveling first class. It came in a bottle that looked like that, and I'm really very, very proud to say, and pleased to say, that thanks to the lovely Linda, who is a very close friend of mine, I have this, which she rescued from a skip. Because the, because the company who bought Jean Patou up decided to throw the archive in a skip. And she decided to reach into the skip and pull things out, so I got five carrier bags for you. I have no idea if any of it's any good. And I was given this bottle. And what's really special about it, it's numbered, and it's bottle number one. So Patu obviously thought it was important enough to keep, but there we are. So rattling on, because I'm now on overtime. I mean, we shouldn't be here. So 1930s are all about flights of fancy. So this whole idea of travel is all the thing. And so one of the first, look at this beautiful image of a night sky. And we have a lovely, lovely love story. So we have the story of Worth. And the story of Worth is really very special. If I knew where my glasses are, it would be even better. Um, with this, the first perfume from a love story, and it's called Donne la Nuit, In the Night. This bottle is made, this bottle is made out of uh, lalit crystal, and where the stars are is not colored, so you see the liquid behind. And as the light comes, it looks like the stars twinkling on the night sky. So uh, Charles Worth was the world's first couturier, an Englishman. He started couture for the Empress Eugenie, and his perfume spelt out this beautiful love letter. Dans la nuit, vers le jour, sans adieu, je reviens vers toi. It means, in the night, just before dawn, with no goodbye, I will return to you. Of course, in 1932, when these perfumes, uh, Je Reviens, was launched, it was just one of a love story, and Don La Nuit was actually the biggest seller. But then the Second World War came, and what better gift to give your lover, your sister, your mother, but a perfume with the name, Je Reviens, I'll Return. And so this became the big perfume success, and here you see the woman hugging it, because it is the promise that uh, he will return to her. I thought you might like to say you've seen this. I don't know if you get the twinkling. I don't know if I can make it twinkle for you. You'll see it? It's really like the night sky uh, twinkling. And I also bought, sorry, because I'm trying to rush as I'm talking, and I also bought the original one of these, gold and so, designed by uh, Pauli Rivenam and Rato. So black, 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 there's the story of the black. Anyhow, moving on, oh, more of that. 
Then another idea of this night sky idea with uh, Guerlain, with Vol de Nuit. Vol de Nuit, the night flight. Antoine de saint exupéry the novelist, was also an aviator. He perfected the technique of taking off and landing airplanes at night. The idea of getting into a little wooden, rickety airplane and going into a night sky would have driven me somewhere, not abroad, but to a frenzy, I have no <laughs> doubt. But it suggested drama and adventure. And so Guerlain made this perfume inspired by the book of Antoine de saint exupéry And so you see this bottle, which has in the middle a metal part like the thing which holds the propeller in place, which is what it looks like spinning. And here's the original book, and this is what the original bottle of, of Vol de Nuit uh, looks like. So we can go on a big journey with it. So, blah, 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 blah. I really have to go fast. So we have um, Schiaparelli shocking. Schiaparelli was a genius. She had a business that was as big as Chanel's, and they hated each other. They didn't dislike each other, they hated each other. She was a great friend of the, a fan and friend of the Surrealists. She was friends with Jean Cocteau and Salvador Dali, and she took Surrealism into her uh, designs. I love this, uh, which has been cut out. Joanna did this, it's beautiful. Uh, it's an original by Vertes, uh, her illustrator, a man called Vertes. So here's the woman dressed as Little Red Riding Hood, and the naughty old fox is after her, and she's got her schiaparelli in her basket. <laughs> or, shocking. And I don't know if you know, but the can can wasn't shocking because of frilly knickers. I'm sure, I hope you understand what the can can was all about. Uh, <laughs> and then you have uh, this. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is the 30s. I mean, it's quite amazing, huh? And then we have uh, here, this is the bottle, which you can see inspired heavily Jean-Paul Gaultier uh, classique. And it's um, designed by Frini, this bottle. And I love the man behind. He has a sword, but it looks like a coup de fouet, like he's going to crack his whip. So, blah. Uh, her arch, arch rival, as I said, was Chanel, who is referred to as that Italian. And Schiaparelli's riposte was always at least I can enter the Ritz through the front door. <laughs> because she was on the Place Vendôme and Rue de Cambon, Rue, Rue Cambon is uh, behind, as I'm sure you know. So, blah, blah. Uh, <coughs> sex change. So, Scholten, Old Spice. So, here's the story. It started off life like this. It, uh, it was called originally Early American Old Spice. It was a scent which was made for women, and here you see the man giving the bottle to a woman. And then there's this lovely thing here, smell like a man-man. <laughs> <laughs> but I wonder if the man-man realized that he'd started off life as a lady, anyhow. <laughs> and they used the tagline, if your grandma hadn't worn it, you would not exist. Which inspired somebody in a marketing department, it inspired somebody in a marketing department to come up with, smell like grandpa. <laughs> Anyhow, you can now get it in bigger sizes, as you'll see. We now come into the 40s, winds of change. Rochas. Rochas is going to come, and he is going to revolutionize women's clothing. I don't know if you know, but these are the things that he ended up doing. He ended up, he, put, got, he created the girdle, which I'm sure is a bit more comfy than a corset. He put fur, jack, fur in the, as the lining of jackets. He was the first person to put a pocket in a skirt. He put a trouser suit. He was the first person to make trousers that women could wear in public. And he also invented the bustier, which is why I chose that picture. Because he was famous for the bustier he made for Mae West. It looked like she was naked. This perfume, femme, he made as a gift for his wife, hence its name. But what I'm sure he didn't tell his wife is that it was based, if you look at the bottle, on Mae West's waist and hip because he had an affair with her. And, um, and the box, you'll see the original box was covered in real lace, dentel lace, because of this garment that he made for Mae West. Next comes uh, Christian Dior with the perfume Miss Dior. He, as you know, made the new look. And the new look, he ended up interpreting into this bottle. Uh, this bottle is the most expensive bottle Baccarat have ever made. It technically is one of the hardest bottles ever to have been uh, done. And <coughs> it came in three colors, red, white, and blue. 
the reason for it, the war's just finished, and this is the color, and this is re uh, the original, original Mistior you're going to get to smell. So you have to do it very, very fast, because I am really over time. Um, why are the bottles red, white, and blue? The war's just finished, it's the color of the tricolor, the stars and stripes, and the union flag. Sorry, again, if you don't mind, I know you're only talking about what I'm giving out, but I, I will get pulled off the stage in a second. Um, he worked with a fantastic man called René Greux. They were huge friends, and René Greux did all the illustration. And the very first advert for Miss Dior was this, a swan, an elegant swan, and around its neck he put a bow. And that inspired Dior to put that little touch on every bottle. So the, bo the bows on Dior's bottles would not exist if it weren't for his friend, the illustrator René Greux. Uh, I thought it might be interesting to say you have seen the red one. The white one. And the one I love most, the blue. They really are extraordinarily special. Right. Boom, 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 boom. Click, click, click. So next comes this scent that you all know, or you think you know, L'Air du Temps. L'Air du Temps, made by Fr Francis Fabron, one of the most copied formulas of all time. The original bottle for it came like a sunburst. This was like the sun coming up after the darkness of the war. Robert Ritchie, who was Nina Ritchie's son, said perfume is not like merchandise. It's a creation of love and it has to have a soul that reflects the woman who wears it. And so he then commissioned Marc Lalique, the son of René Lalique, to make this very, very famous bottle, which I think only looks good in this size, personally. Um, and the story is simple. The story is simple. These are the two intertwined doves of peace flying around the world, because the world has just finished a war. So the idea was every time the woman touched herself with this scent, she was caressing herself with peace, which she had craved for so many years. Blah, 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 blah. I keep putting things down wrong. OK. So here you see a very, very interesting look for the 50s. The 50s is all about the American influence. We have suddenly met GIs, and GIs talk about things called coffee percolators. <laughs> and refrigerators. We don't have those in Britain. We have to put the milk out on the windowsill to keep it cold. So this whole idea of the American lifestyle is going to grab us like you can't begin to imagine. And the person who catches it better than anybody else is Esther Lauder. And Esther Lauder creates a product called Youth Dew. It's a bath oil. So she takes all the guilt away from us. It's not perfume. It's just an oil that you can then put a little bit on. It comes in a screw top bottle. So because human beings are nosy, we touch it and we get a touch on ourselves. So that when we walk away from the shop, we have youth dew on us. So here's a story I would like to read out, so please just listen to it because I think it's lovely. Esther Lauder hailed a cab in New York and the driver said, Lady, you smell good, is that youth dew? How would you know that, said Lauder. He said, last week a lady opened a bottle and put it on. It was so nice, I said I wouldn't charge her the fare if she gave me the bottle for my wife, which she did. You smell so good, I hate to see you leave, but I've got to charge you. <laughs> of course, Lorda said, so paid him and gave him a very big tip. She said, by the way, I'm Esther Lorda. He said, by the way, I'm Cary Grant, and drove away. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> and there is Lorda in the top. Uh, or working. So, a lucky charm. So, we're really hurtling toward the end of this talk. So, a lucky charm. Dior was the most superstitious man, and he had a hot house where he grew, where he grew lily of the valley. He had a hot house where he grew lily of the valley all year long, because it was his um, superstition to sow a sprig of lily of the valley in the hem of every costume to bring it luck. So this really was his lucky charm. It was made by the perfumer Rudnitska. 
When it was very first made, it came in a beautiful Baccarat crystal bottle with uh, bronze flowers which were gilded, and this is what the original bottle looked like. When it was first made, there were only 60 pieces made in a year. The world was not an equal place. You were a rich still, or you weren't. The original bottle, this is the illustration by Gruer, and here you see the bottle as if it's on the dais inside the Avenue Montaigne, as if the woman is looking at herself in a dress in the mirror. This perfume, I think, uh, is the work of a genius. And I think the bottle is something totally genius, too. He loved 18th century classicism, and I see, think you'll see it reflected in this bottle beautifully. So, uh, let's just come up here. So, okay. then we come to the 60s. Man's just landed on the moon, and sexual liberation comes. And so, Guerlain is going to launch a perfume called Chamade. Chamade is a very special word in French. If you meet someone in, in, in England, if you meet somebody and your heart does that, we say, my heart thumped. The French, of course, have a little saying for it. Mon cœur battement le chamade. My heat, heart beats the chamade, which was the name for an old drum beat for soldiers to tell the other soldiers what to do, and it is the very final drum beat, the drum beat of surrender. So when you look at the bottle, you can see that the bottle is, it indeed is an upside-down heart, and the stopper is like a teardrop or a dagger that's going to pierce the heart. It's named after the novel from François Sagan called <coughs> La Chamade. So, then, 1964, the new thing for the men. I love this advert. So, oh, you great, big, beautiful brute. Love her eye makeup. It's kind of quite fabulous and of the period. And then along comes uh, Aramis. Aramis was made by a perfumer called Bernard Chant. He had made, originally, he had made um, Cabochard. And when he made this, it was such a huge success that Lorde used him for nearly all of the next generation of perfumes they were to launch. And I think it's really important to understand when you look at this very old advert how this was the brand that re really pioneered men's grooming, which we take for granted today. But in its day, it was utterly pioneering and a really staggering uh, creation. And then a the nice little story, the story of Percy Savage. So what is the story of Percy Savage? Who was this man? So Dior were just about to launch a new scent for men, and the scent was going to be called Favari. I love the illustration of a man sitting in a chair where you'd normally expect to see a cognac or a cigar, but he's naked with his bottle of perfume and may be very happy. They did use the advert, but they changed the name of the scent. We don't know why, because the perfume always, almost went into production, and they have bottles of Favari, in fact, in their archive. But they had a naming meeting... And in the name, I wouldn't give it, they all know it's a bunch. In the naming meeting, uh, they were waiting for someone to come, an Englishman who was always late. And when he walked in, somebody said, Oh, Sauvage. <laughs> and that is how Oh, Sauvage got its name. <laughs> René Gruer designed this man. This man is called Anatole. And Anatole started off as this wild barbarian. And as you look at the pictures, he comes a little bit more refined as he goes along. And the bottle never changed, whether it was going to be called Favari or uh, Eau Sauvage. Now we come into the 70s. Man's just landed on the moon. I clicked that too quickly, but never mind. Uh, Greenham Common has women burning their bras along with Jane Fonda, chaining themselves to the railings. And women really are fighting for equality. And women realize that, yes, they can end up getting that job in the boardroom, and they are not going to put up with any nonsense for it. <coughs> Charles, Rev Charles Revson, the man who owned, founded Revlon, decided that he would make a scent which had the code name Cosmo Girl. Cosmopolitan had just launched, and it was the first magazine that told women about orgasms and clitorises and everything that was sexual. And it was shocking, and of course, women had craved for it. And he understood that's what this young woman craved. So this perfume was totally marketed based around this young Cosmo girl. And so he rather arrogantly, as his name was Charles, called his perfume Charlie. 
and it is one of the first photographs of our industry, it might sound silly, where a woman is looking directly into the camera lens. Normally, women in any advert you'll see before are gazing down. She's having none of it. She's going there, and she knows where she's going. So every woman wanted this. He said this, let others come up with the idea, then exploit it like no other. And his other very famous line, you all know, but you maybe don't know the second half of it. He said, all publicity is good publicity. But the end of that saying is, as long as they spell your name right. So next, the great opium den. So here may be the only time you'll ever see these images. I don't know that they exist anywhere else. They're mine. They're the original drawings for how opium maybe was going to be. And here we all know the famous bottle. So what you maybe don't know is that this perfume, no one could believe that Saint Laurent would call a perfume after a drug. It was considered mad, foolish, reckless. But of course, it got him on the front page of basically every newspaper around the world that was saying how terrible it was. So the demand for this perfume was enormous. And it might be interesting for you to know that when it launched, they sold more in a week than Chanel sold number five in a year, just to give you an idea of what a phenomenon this perfume was. The advertising showed a woman in what looked like an opium den. And they had a very clever idea to cut the orders so it became almost impossible to buy it. So like people craving the next fix, we all become crazy to own opium. Then comes the 1980s, and this is the decade of I and me and not you and we. This is the decade where the Sloan Ranger becomes the yuppie. It is the decade of the Filofax and the Porsche and of seven o'clock breakfast meetings. And if you leave an office before 10, you're a wimp. We are going to show the world what we can afford and it's all about designer logos, and it's all about look at me. And so what does our perfume industry do? It gives us just that. We're obsessed with Dynasty and Dallas, and we want to smell like Rodeo Drive. And so a perfume is made that is so enormous that it becomes the first perfume to be banned from restaurants all around the world. <laughs> because when a woman walked in with it, it was all you could smell. So this perfume was all about consumerism, and we loved it. And I remember this perfume when it launched. It launched exclusively in Harvey Nichols, and there was a, a queue down Sloan Street every day for it. The French were having none of it, because the Americans had stolen what they thought was theirs, and so the company that answered it was Dior with Poison. I remember when Poison launched, people went in, there were always two lines with Poison. The people that didn't realize it was an English word asked for a bottle of Poisson. <laughs> and the other were the people that went in thinking they were so original, I'll take some Poison for my mother-in-law. <laughs> and I heard that line more times than I care to tell you. So. I put here poison inside and out, and the reason I wrote it is I don't know if you realize how clever this bottle is. When people were illiterate, in medieval times onward, poison bottles always had ribs on the outside, so that when you touched it, you know what was inside was poison. The bottle itself is an apple, the poison apple, the fruit of so I hope that that's sort of loosely interesting. And then I just put in this very, very special presentation, which was a limited edition. OK, so we've all ended up spending so much money that we've spent more than we really own. We buy properties that are so overinflated, the world has just gone into a recession, and we're going to hear a brand new phrase, negative equity. And people committed suicide because of it. People despaired because of it. It was ugly. And along with that ugliness came something else, an illness we knew nothing about, HIV, AIDS. All of this happened in cities, the consumerism, touching somebody, and who knows what could happen. So this decade is the decade where you'll see a kaleidoscope of colors. We have a red ribbon for AIDS, and we have the pink ribbon for breast cancer, and so the colors come for whatever cause you're supporting. We know we don't like the world. It's ugly. So all we want to do is get away. 
And the company that's going to help us do it more better than anybody else is Calvin Klein. So, first you become obsessed. <laughs> then, you pledge eternity. <laughs> and maybe, in the end, all you want to do is to <laughs> escape. I hope that someone had the wit in their uh, marketing to have put them in that order, because it's how they were launched, because I think it's quite lovely. Where did we want to escape to? We wanted to escape to the seaside, because the seaside is carefree times and holidays. And again, we see a reference to something from the past, <coughs> because this, I'm sure, makes you think of rather a famous film from here to eternity. So if we don't want to escape to the sea, where else might we want to escape to? The fun fair. We want to escape to our childhood, and we want the smell of candy floss and toffee apples. And this perfume, I say about it, it's an angel that almost never saw the light of day. For this perfume failed in every piece of test marketing. And yet one woman, a woman called Vera Stubi, who was the CEO of Thierry Mugler Perfumes, pushed and pushed and pushed. And so this perfume launched on the market, and it totally changed the Oriental Accord and became one of the biggest selling perfumes uh, of its time. So we come toward the end of the story. We've almost caught up with where we are now. So we've wanted to escape to the fun fair, and we've wanted to escape to the sea. So we don't want perfumes that are sexual anymore. Maybe that common thread in the base that was referred to before. So perfumes in society, we are so not wanting contact with other people, sexual content, that we become voyeurs. We watch Celebrity Big Brother and we read Heat and Chat and Hello and OK. We want to see what the celebs are doing. We want that as our world. And so this is the decade of the celebrity perfume. <coughs> Jennifer Lopez, Glow, and so on and so on. It wasn't new. They've been before. But that's what happened in this decade. In the 2000s, we have something else, the renaissance of the perfumer. So I think it's very interesting that where we are at the moment, there seems to be this big backlash to the volume of things in the market. And the consumers are looking for something different. So I hope that this list is interesting. These are some of the brands that have sprung up over the last few years, which I hope you'll agree as you read them. It's not complete, but they sort of define where our industry is at the moment. And I think it's really rather lovely. Uh, I could have put my name on there too, but it might have seemed a little <laughs> self-indulgent. <laughs> Anyhow, so here's the very, very end of my talk. What is a scent to any of you? What actually is a scent to any of you? Scent is something which is so extraordinarily special. When I was a very, very tiny boy, my mother came into my bedroom to kiss me goodnight. I always say I was six or seven. I really have no idea how old I was. And I remember my mother standing in the entrance of my bedroom. She was wearing a gold lame dress, which I'm sure was terribly fashionable. And as the light hit her from behind, it was as if she was glowing as if she had a corona or a halo around her. As a little boy, that image is an image from a book. It's the image of a fairy or an angel. It was like my mother had been transformed. And as she came and kissed me goodnight, before she went out, it was the first time I made a connection between a smell, the smell of her face powder, the smell of the scent she wore, a person and a minute in time. And I've always said that was the moment I believe I was put on a path that I was born to walk down. What do I say about perfume? I've always said this. Scent has the ability to bring a smile to our lips or a tear from our eyes. Sit with someone and breathe in their scent, and they give you the most precious of all gifts, because the gift they give you, silent, but it is the gift of memory. You may not have seen someone for years and years, but with one breath, just like that, the memories come flooding back. Dreams are revived. Love is rekindled. Now, I have two scents that I would like you to smell, and then it's the end of uh, me, late. I'm really sorry, Linda. Um, the first of them, I've lived, I'm very lucky that I've lived with my partner for 44 years. He always used the same scent. And one day he said to me, I need some new uh, fragrance. I said, but you have three bottles upstairs. What? No, no, you need something new. And the scent that he always wore, he said to me, it doesn't smell right. And the formula had been changed. So I was in the south of France making a perfume for one of my clients, bespoke perfume. And the scent I'm about to give you means nothing to you. 
but it's very precious scent to me because it's a scent I made him as a gift. It is my vetiver. It is made with all the passion that I can muster from my heart and know-how. And I would like to say rather arrogantly, I hope you agree, I think it's the most beautiful vetiver you'll ever smell. <laughs> <laughs> So this for me is how I think a man should smell. Somebody who's not trying to be anything other than who he is. But maybe that's because I mingle it with the person I live with. OK, so the very end of my story, before we all say goodbye. So the very, very, so the very, very end of my story, if I could just crave your indulgence for one more second, is I decided. I launched my commercial perfumes for one reason, one reason only, because my mother died. And I wanted to leave a legacy in my mother's name. I'd made perfumes for years. So to launch a commercial perfume brand in my 50s, I'm now 62, was quite an unusual thing. My brand's not even eight years old. Harrods told me, as Linda said, I had to ask them, how much do we make? I've never made a commercial product. They said, make this much. It will last you four to six months with no advertising, we sold out of every piece of stock within 10 days. And with six months, within six months, we're the number one selling brand in Harrods and the most successful launch in their history. People have often asked me, <coughs> people have often asked me, why? And I've always said, of course I don't know. The only thing I hope is that people can feel in my work there is something human. Because I don't know what else, uh, what else there is. So what I'd like to do, the scent that you're just about to smell is a scent that w took me a long time to make uh, I thought no one would be interested in it. And it's called a goodnight kiss. You know the reason why now. I had to make an ingredient. If we just give the perfume and not the... Um, I had to make the powder note you smell, and you'll smell a powder note. And I wanted to make something a little bit old-fashioned. And it shimmers like a diamond necklace. I fell in love with jewelry because of my mother. And so this perfume, when you smell it, suggests something I remember from when I was young, that when perfume was in the air, something special was happening. So I hope that you like it. And this is how I would like, so as it's coming and you're smelling it, this is like how I would like to finish my talk. I would like you just to look at the screen, because while this scent means little to you, when I smell this scent, When I smell this scent, this scent reminds me of my mother and growing up. And so one of the things we do in the Fragrance Foundation, which has caught everybody's imagination, but if you don't know we do it, I'd ask you to look. This week is National Fragrance Week, and we do something I think is very beautiful, which is something called scent memories. All of you have a memory to do with scent. And please share them, because they're beautiful things. So I have nothing else to say. I would like to thank uh, you, and I'm really sorry I overrun, um, but I hope that you liked it. Oh. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I'd like to thank all the people that have done so much work in the background sitting and printing those labels out and sticking them all out. I mean, that's a job and a half. So, uh, but really, thank, thank you all. Thank you for coming, and thank Linda and her team for everything they do uh, for Fragrance Foundation. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I don't really know what to say, but I hope, and I know it for you, I hope was the most incredible evening. We're so <laughs> honored to have Roger do this for us. We've been friends for 20 years. And I was her giver away at her wedding. He I've did. never <laughs> done that before. He did. You did. <laughs> and um, it's a very special relationship. It and is. Roger, there is no one else like you within our industry. Thank you. And very so much. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.